Good morning, everyone. My name is Robin Ayub. I'm the founder of the Localization Fireside Chat podcast channel. Uh, through my podcast, I've had the privilege and I have the privilege to be um, to host insightful conversations, experts in the localization industry. Uh, it's an incredible opportunity, really, to bring together thought leaders, industry professionals, to tell their intriguing localization stories. And I find the more I talk to individuals and professionals in our industry, the more I am surprised how many intriguing stories there is as to how everybody started in the industry. Um, we also talk in the, on this channel about some, we discuss some of the trends, some of the challenges, the innovation in the industry, and um, very fast, the localization fireside chat has become a valuable resource for anyone really, uh, who is passionate about the localization and translation industry. And as we dive into the captivating world of languages and demographics and human connections, I invite you all to connect with me and join me in this engaging conversation throughout my podcast. You can find us on YouTube. You can find us on your favorite podcast channel. We're on all of them. And I invite you to subscribe, connect, and share uh, and engage with this uh, content. I am uh, privileged and honored to have with me as a guest this morning, uh, Brian Masso. Uh, Brian um, was an instructor and uh, he was a translator actually, and, and a revisor and a trainer at the Canadian government. Uh, he's retired now, he lives here in Toronto. And I can't wait to dive uh, deeper into his expertise uh, from his perspective after so many years in the industry and, uh, and learn from it because there's a lot to be learned uh, as we look forward in our future, there's a lot to be learned from the uh, from those who have done it, have experienced it, and have developed careers in in, in this particular industry. So, Brian, welcome to the channel. Uh, thanks for being with me this morning. And if you don't mind introducing yourself to the audience. Uh, hello, everyone. Uh, I'm Brian Mossop, and uh, I worked for the Canadian government's Translation Bureau for 40 years from 1974 to 2014 when I retired. Uh, but from 1980 on and still, I've been teaching at the um, School of Translation at, um, at York University here in Toronto, uh, where I teach both specialized translation, my specialty is forestry, we have a lot of trees in Canada. Uh, and uh, revision. Revision is the main thing uh, I teach. Uh, I also uh, conduct regular um, online one-day training sessions in revision. I've done that for the United Nations, the uh, European Commission, and and uh, other organizations, oh, the International Maritime Asso Organization, and several other uh, groups. Finally, I also write about translation. I've written a textbook, uh, now in its fourth edition, called Revising and Editing for Translators. Uh, and it's used in translation schools, I believe, around the world. Uh, and uh, I've also written some articles in translation journals about revision. So that's me. Nice to meet you, uh, Brian. And uh, thanks again for being on the show. Uh, ladies and gentlemen, we're in the uh, presence of celebrity, an author in our industry, uh, a teacher, um, teaching the new generation of our translators, uh, young ones, how to do uh, translation, how to become better translators. And he's still engaged after so many years in the business retirement. And I always say in our, this on our channel, I haven't met anybody who is 100% retired from this industry. Everybody, you know, try to slow down a little bit, but do other things. And the passion that it's inside of each one of us who works in the industry currently, or who have worked in the industry in the past, it never extinguished, um, you know, as, you, as, you, as, as we uh, transform ourselves and take a metamorphosis in terms of moving on to a new, <laughs> to a new chapter in our lives, et cetera. So, Brian, just before we dig deeper into the topic of revision, I'm intrigued and, and, and the customers are intrigued because industry obviously sells services to customers, are intrigued as to why revision is important. And the context of that is that, look, if I buy a translation from a, a good translator that, that, you know, excellent at what they do, why revision is needed in this case? Uh, maybe you can tell us a little bit about what is revision and why is it needed? 
Well, revision is the art of reading translations to find mistakes. And the reason revision is needed, even with highly qualified people who've translated in a particular specialty for years, is that everyone makes mistakes. Uh, people, people's attention gets distracted. They're tired at the end of the day. So everyone makes mistakes. And then uh, revision is the art of noticing, and it's a special art, of noticing that something needs to be changed. So that's basically the answer to your question. So, um, so from from that aspect, and we can we can talk a little bit more detail about it. Uh, have you always worked in the revision capacity, or have you been a translator before? I guess let's go back a couple of steps backward and and tell me a little bit. How did you start, or how did you you know became intrigued in this industry and decided I want to I want to be involved in this industry and you know, walk me back to your first job in this industry, I guess. Um, well, I became a translator by pure chance. Uh, originally, I was a graduate student of linguistics, and I was investigating one of the um, indigenous languages of Canada. Then one day, I saw an ad in, the, in a local newspaper from the federal government saying translators want it for French to English translation. So uh, the Official Languages Act had just been passed a few years earlier. So that meant there was suddenly a huge demand for translators. Uh, so I applied and uh, I re then received, I wrote a test. And then I received a letter inviting me to move to the national capital, Ottawa, to work, but I said, no, I don't particularly want to leave Toronto. So a year later, they said, oh, there's now a position in Toronto. So there I was. And I started work on June 10th, 1974. And they, um, so first I was just a translator. I was revised by a senior translator mm -hmm. uh, and working in various specialties. Well, the government of Canada translates in practically every specialty since the government deals with everything. Uh, and then uh, I became a revisor two, just two years later. This is because there was a sudden influx of hundreds of new uh, translators. There were no uh, I, I believe there were no translation schools in Canada at that time. Uh, and uh, so uh, it was just people with language degrees. And um, they had to promote people to revision positions very quickly. So there I was, suddenly a reviser, and they sent me for three days of training as a reviser, er, three days of training every month. <clears throat> where someone looked at my revisions and criticized them and showed me what I'd done, where I'd changed too much and where I hadn't changed enough. And that lasted for a year or two. Uh, so I got really well trained in revision by a senior person who'd had a lot of experience doing it. And that was how I became a reviser, but I never stopped translating. For my whole career, I also translated from French to English alongside uh, revision. And eventually I started training other um, translators. I became a... a so viewer. Brian, your, your specialty is uh, French to English, uh, the language combination. And for the audience, um, uh, the I'm, I'm guessing, Brian, correct me if I'm wrong, that an individual can translate to their mother tongue, I'm assuming from a from a concept perspective. Obviously people can have you know, a super intelligence and they probably can translate to more than one language, but naturally speaking, somebody can translate to one or two maybe language combinations. And what's the rule around that? Is there like a specific rule around it or general understanding? How many languages can an individual translate? Well, I think, Two, maybe three, is the maximum that anyone can do well. In um, for the official languages in Canada, 
the general rule is that you translate into your mother tongue, but some people do translate in the opposite direction. In fact, one of my first assignments was they sent me to the headquarters of Canada's Weather Service, which is here in Toronto. And there was only enough work from French to English to occupy me for half a day. So on the other half day, they had me translating from English to French, which was, a, and of course, it's much more difficult to translate into your second language. Uh, so luckily, there was a woman there who uh, was a, a French, uh, an English to French translator, a native speaker of French, and she she revised my uh, translations. We also revised each other um, uh, just for meaning. Uh, it's sometimes said that revisers should only be revising into their native language. And that's true when it comes to language and style. But for meaning alone, you can uh, revise in either direction. I mean, I can tell whether a translation into French means the same thing as the English source text. Yes. Now, um, when we talk about... Uh revision and for those who are not too familiar with the exact, the exact process of revision we are not talking about proofreading we're not talking about grammatical errors we're not talking you could uh, but not necessarily talking about <coughs> grammatical error this is linguistic revision uh just to be precise am i correct right uh yes the first thing you're looking for of course is mistranslations and the second thing you're looking for is a style which is suited to the people who are going to be reading the translation. For example, if you're translating a public health text, you want to make sure there are not a lot of, of terms, medical terms that come from Latin and Greek, because they're not going to be understood by the public. Mm -hmm. So that's the kind of thing you're looking for in uh, as a reviser. And that becomes very important um, in terms of addressing the content to a specific level of education by the audience right am i am i correct oh so yes yes so progressing a content to a level to you know high school education versus university educated or phd educated um uh, there's different levels of complexity of the text that the revisor probably has to keep in mind am i correct oh yes you have to you have to be very sensitive to styles when you're revising Okay. Tell me a little bit about um, your uh, university, um, uh, uh, your teaching at York uh, University right now in Toronto. Um, what, you know, give me a snapshot of, you know, who are uh, the students? Are these young students are, you know, going through their translation degrees or are they coming from the industry to come in to take their revisor's degree? Um, what, what do you think, um, if, if you don't mind, elaborate a little bit on that? Well, I teach two groups of students. One is young undergraduate students who are all translating from uh, French to English and are learning to revise French to English translations. Uh, the other group of students are graduate students who are doing a master's degree in linguistics, uh, sorry, in translation. Uh, and they, some of them do indeed come from the industry. They just, they want to get a, um, a master's degree. So they're very different. Uh, they speak a range of languages. In that course, I typically have some people who are uh, Chinese English translators, um, Farsi English, uh, uh, quite a range. I, I think last time I taught it a year ago, I had six different, six or seven different source languages. Because the, I'm assuming, and again, um, correct me if I'm wrong, I'm assuming the concept of, of revision is uh, independent of the language combination, correct? Oh, yes. Yeah. So you, yeah, could, although, you, could take, well, you could take a concept and apply it to any language combination you want. Well, the, the basic concepts can be, but I always have to warn people who are, who are um, uh, translating in language pairs I don't have that there may be things they need to look for, which I don't know about, special cultural related things, mm. or emphasizing a particular aspect of revision, certain particular um, parameters of revision they need to look at. 
Yeah. And, and, um, you know, we're having, we're talking, we're going to be targeting a whole bunch of topics I've got for you uh, this morning, Brian. Uh, one of the things that people are always nowadays talking about, and as you know, like since you started in the uh, 70s in the industry, and, um, and, and I see that you've started at an area where content has grown tremendously because of the uh, language law has just passed. And I'm assuming there was a bunch of work that needs to be done, but not enough people to be to do it. And same thing still exists now. Um, with the advancement of communication tools, etc., content is being created at an accelerated rate, much accelerated rate, and it's compounding every year in terms of growth. Um, what do you think of the advancement of technology in the way we're creating the initial translation I'm referring to? You know, the new tools, generative AI, machine translation, et cetera. And there's this thing now is being created. Um, well, the industry has been delivering for many years. It's called post editing. So, where do you see the revision playing a role? Did we modif- do we need to modify it to, to accommodate the new technologies or the same concepts still apply? How, how does that work? Well, I think revision is rather different from translation. Um, the, the tools that exist, whether it's um, uh, translation memory or machine translation or very recently chat GPT, um, mainly apply to translation. They don't apply so much to revision. I've just been experimenting with chat GPT to try to get it to... How did you find it? Well, the, the, of course, the trick with chat GPT is asking the right question. So what I found was I, I gave it a, a, a French text and an English translation, and I asked it to revise the English translation for accuracy, language, and style. But that may not have been the right question to ask, because first the first thing it did was the retranslated the French text mm-hmm. instead of revising the English text. Well, of course, well, revision is not retranslation. That's just time-wasting. Uh, so it's possible that uh, I just asked the wrong question. Yeah. Now the uh, w- the post editing function, which many people refer to as a light revision in a lot of cases, oh. um, where you know you've got a, a machine translated output, uh, where you probably need to verify a little bit of you know just to make sure that the quality standards are there, the meanings are correctly translated. Um, et cetera. So instead of the translator, you know, beside the, uh, the use of, of um, uh, you know, translation memory, using an actual uh, MT output to accelerate that output from the uh, translator, then you need to have a post editing or light revision on that machine output to make sure that the, um, some sort of a quality standard has been applied to the text. Mm-hmm. Have you dealt with that type of work? Or? Oh, yes. Oh, yes. Well, one of the um, differences of opinion here is whether uh, post-editing is a kind of revision. If you if you think of it from the point of view of workflow, post-editing is actually a way to translate the text in the first place. Mm-hmm. A post-edited text can then go to a reviser. So uh, it isn't actually revision some people although it feels like revision when you're doing it uh it's actually an earlier s- step in the translation procedure it's the original translation of of the um of the text so do you ever think about a way or have you ever wondered sometime um, I'm, I'm sure there are there are many like technologies out there that allows for automatic revision. Uh, can the revision process be automated in any way? Uh, no, I don't think it can. Uh, because and why is that? It's it's the technique of noticing problems, and I, as far as I've been able to determine so far, no machine can tell you whether there's a mistranslation, and no machine can tell you whether. Um, the style, well, perhaps now chat GPT can tell you, can correct for style. 
uh, although I haven't experimented with that, turn a medical text with Greek and Latin terms into a, a public health uh, no. text. I don't know about that. But basically, um, revision is still something that goes on in a human brain, unlike translation, which can now be done to a great extent mm -hmm. uh, um, with a machine. So based on what you've seen throughout your career, do you feel like revision step needs to be applied to every single text or can revision step be modified, you know, based on the text that you're dealing with? Oh, no, no. Some people think that, that every text has to be um, seen by a second translator. In fact, the international standard, ISO 17100, oh. says every text shall be, if you're certified under that standard, Correct. it says every text shall be. Now, the standard we have here in Canada, though, says uh, that uh, every for every text, you have to decide whether it needs to be seen by a second translator. So you need criteria for deciding whether uh, a text needs to be seen by a second translator. So some yeah. texts do, some texts don't. Also, you can revise just part of a text and then decide that, you know, while I've translated, I've revised five pages and I haven't found any problems. There's a risk in that, but then there's a risk in everything. So, Yeah, uh, correct. Um, you know, the... Um, uh, the uh, uh, there are the ISO, the ISO standards are well known, and everybody who is certified by ISO, I guess, and audited on a yearly basis, they need to abide by by those rules. But you know, the oh, it's always the struggle between how much work this um, industry has since 1974 till now has created. Um, in the every year we look behind, we say, well, content has grown by you know. X amount of percentage per year. I mean, the average is about 25, 20 to 25 per year. But some years, they, they, you know, we like the year uh, after COVID, content grow, grew by almost 30, 40% because there was, you know, there's some backlogs there and it has to be, and it made it to the, it made it to the forefront. With all this content growth, um, the uh, amount of translators, and you can agree to that, that we need to be turning them into revisors. Um, basically, we don't have any of them. We don't have as many of them. I and mean, we should have more, obviously, to satisfy the entire industry, globally and locally. But we're not getting more of those revisers. So I guess we are at a fork in the road. Um, we either, the, the process has to be modified or we need more people to do more work. What do you, what do you, any comments on that? Well, uh, first of all, there's peer revision. You can just exchange with someone. If you work in an office, you can just revise each other's texts, or at least a selection of each other's texts, not all of them. Uh, and if you're a freelance, you can hook up with other freelance, other freelances and say, well, I think I'd like to have this text looked at for yes. a particular aspect. Do you think I've used the right terminology? Do you think it's the right style? Correct. So, so uh, there's no way of revising everything. Uh, it has to be um, it has to be reduced um, based perhaps on who translated it. If it's a person who's new to a field, they've mm -hmm. never done any finance translation, for example, then mm -hmm. all their texts should be revised for at least a couple of months. Yeah, and then you gradually reduce the amount of revision. So there's, there are ways of reducing revision. And of course, you don't always need to do a comparison with mm -hmm. the source text. Sometimes you can just read the translation and just glance at the source text occasionally if there's a problem. Yeah. So what you're talking about is a spot checking, basically. Yes. Yeah. yeah. Um, so take me back a little bit to your um, days in the public uh, sector when you were working for the government. So what has changed? What did you see the progression of changes throughout the Bureau, for instance, uh, since 1974 till when you retired in uh, 2014? You must have seen leaps and bounds of, of, of uh, technology, directions, amount of work, number of employees, a process, uh, public-private relationship. How, how, you know, tell me, talk a little bit about that. 
Well, when I started, I was uh, working on a manual typewriter, uh, and then it was an electrified typewriter, uh, then it was an IBM Selectric typewriter, and then eventually around in the mid-1980s, I first got a desktop computer. Um, the the big one big change that happened is that it used there used to be more translators in the translation bureau. At one point, there were well over a thousand translators just for the official the two official languages, and uh, gradually the amount that was outsourced to the private sector increased. Uh, I think that was part of the. Uh, part of the neoliberal trend the, to promote the private sector. When a conservative government came into power in 1983, I think it started to promote uh, more, sending more work out to the private sector uh, and receiving bids from freelancers to do uh, jobs. So I was spending more time doing quality control of uh, freelance work Whereas previously it had been all in-house work, mm -hmm. and I think that's that was the big uh, change. As for technology, um, well, uh, translation. Well, of course, computers themselves appeared, and the big, the single biggest thing that happened was in 1998 when Google appeared, because that changed research. Mm -hmm. research on the subject matter of your text. Before that, I had to go out to, to university libraries and find journals on the topic on the book, on the shelves. It took hours and hours. And suddenly with Google, I could just sit there and things would, and information would just pop up on the screen in front of me. That was the single biggest change. I tell you, uh, you mentioned uh, the physical research, like actually going through the books and trying to uh, find things. Um, I remember, uh, you know, uh, visiting one of our offices in, and, and I've seen like uh, racks and racks of books and dictionaries for various topics. And that was like, and, um, you know, for, for you and for the audience of who doesn't know me much, who don't know me much, I've been in the industry for almost uh, over two decades now. So yes, I <laughs> I also started a long time ago, and I've seen a lot of changes. You know, I've seen our you know translators running to the libraries, our own internal library, and picking up like the, let's say they're working on a telecom uh, project, picking up a dictionary that deals with telecom, and you know try to verify uh, verify things. Part of the translation, you know, today everybody's in the, in the consumer world. Everybody, everything is at your fingertips. You know, you want something done you download an app you go you, you know get it done but not too long ago a few years ago that was not the case at all you actually had to go and do some research and in fact you know out of souvenir i brought two big dictionaries and um just to you know we were um you know getting rid of them because we moved to digital etc i said you know i'd like to keep a couple of souvenirs and uh, one of them two dictionaries and they're pretty large books um, on various topics, so it's pretty cool uh, to see the tra to see the transformation from and the amount of information that is available now for translators. So, you know, uh, the translation job or function or uh, or or, or um, services that has been offered throughout the years from somebody translating an official document, be it a passport or CV or you know uh, a birth certificate for somebody. And officially stamping it, that means that it's been done by a, a certified translator. That's another topic altogether. When we talk about certification of translators, when we, um, you know, uh, a few years ago, and as you you alluded, you mentioned it earlier, Brian, where, you know, at the beginning, you know, if you speak the language, um, you have a language degree, um, perhaps you could become a translator. So come on on. Um, and, you know, that was the norm. I mean, if you speak the language, you can do some translation and that's fine now. There's some, uh, there's some, uh, I would say, uh, forms around the profession. So we put some boundaries around. We put some certification. There are some uh, training, official training, and you're and you're involved in that in your university, York University. So it is not as I want to say free fall for everybody who speaks languages now. But still, today it's hard for the consumer to decipher. You know, 
is this job being done correctly? And you hear people complaining about, oh, it wasn't, you know, this job, it was not done correctly. But meanwhile, from the revisor perspective, no, it's done correctly, but maybe not to the liking of the customer. Yes, um, I often had complaints from uh, our customers about uh, about a text. And generally, when I showed it to uh, the manager, who was also a translator, they said, well, there's nothing wrong with this. It's just that the, the client actually knows the two languages and they've just made up their own translation. And they say, well, it, you know, it's not quite right. It's not, it wasn't literal enough for them. So where do you see uh, where do you see the um, the industry? I I know you're you're still teaching uh, revision right now, and it's uh, it's great that you're doing that. I hope we have many individuals who wants to contribute to the education of the new generation in the future. But where do you see the industry going in terms of all the tools that you're you're aware of, and uh, they're coming to the industry in 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 I mean, I just got on a daily basis. I guess somebody with a brand new idea from a technology perspective trying to either A, speed up the process, uh, the administrative process, or speed up the translation process or some sort of a process to deal with efficiency in our, uh, in our, in our industry. Where do you see the industry going from your perspective? Well, um, my view of, of the future is that no one knows the future. All right. That is, um, human beings, I think, are very bad at predicting what's going to happen. In we speculate future. a lot. <laughs> yes. You could uh, now. Of course, it depends what you mean by the future. If you mean just six months from now or a year from right. now, that's a little right. different. But if you mean where are things going over the next decade or two decades, I think the answer is no one knows. Yeah, the short term one. That's what I meant. Uh, um, and in our in technology, uh, you know, I'm always reminded that uh, technology is accelerating at a rapid rate. We can't measure it in years. Uh, years would be in a different world altogether. Uh, I'm more thinking about six months to a year, uh, maybe a year and a half down the road. And, you know, regardless of how we see this, um, I think there is two competing philosophies in our industry. The one that is, um, you know, focusing on automation and, you know, process improvement and doing things a lot faster than what we're doing right now for the sheer content that we're dealing with. And the other, the other part, I would compare it to the artisan way of continuous, you know, doing things. Um, you know, if you have two bakeries in your in your neighborhood, one that produces it, produce bread via machines and output as many as they want in terms of bread, and you got another bakery who's actually, you know, do things by hand, um, carefully, you know, put the you know bake and put the products on the shelves, etc. <clears throat> those two different things, and you have two different customers for those. You've got a customer who just want to walk in, pay for it, and walk out. And you've got a customer that, you know, take pride in what they're buying, and they want to actually pay a little extra to get a better product. And I think those two philosophies are competing within the same within the same industry. And CSA Research put the industry around 19,000 round, 19,000 companies globally, and they're increasing on a day-to-day -day basis. So, with, you know, based on what I just said, uh, any comments on, <laughs> on, on, yes. this, on this school of thoughts? Well, I once wrote in an article that if you can't translate with pencil and paper, then you can't translate with any machine, any technology. There's a certain back to fundamental meaning. Yes, there's a there's a certain basic mental ability that only a human brain can can uh, can do. Mm -hmm. It's a bit of an illusion to think that a machine can do it for you. Uh, you have to be very careful uh, not to overestimate the power of machines. I've read a bit of research that shows that some people who post edit uh, machine outputs don't actually look at the source text very much. They tend to just, just because it reads so well, mm -hmm. with machine translation, because the text reads so well, they, they tend to to think, well, obviously, well, if if this sentence reads too well, it's probably reads so well, it's probably a good translation. But is it? How yeah. can you know unless you look at the source text? 
Uh, did we translate it correctly? I guess that's your question. Okay, it reads yeah. well, fine, but is that what we meant to translate? Is that yeah. what you mean? Mm. So, so I absolutely agree. Like, uh, you need to, um, you know, at least get the meaning correctly uh, for what you're trying to translate, especially when it comes to, you know, specific document. Like, if you're working on a contract or you're working on, you know, some um, uh, a drug uh, description or, um, uh, you know, something really, um, you need to be careful of the meanings. Uh, those, I mean, everything needs to be careful of the meaning. It doesn't matter what content it is, but you, you know, that's the job of the translator, conveying the exact meaning from the original, from the source language to the target language. The, the question is, and it's, it's, it's a consumer question. You know, for the translator, probably one of you want, everybody wants to do the best job possible, take their time, get the, get the text correctly. But from a consumer perspective, I think the tolerance of, of, um, of, I don't want to call it bad translation, but I'm just calling it the tolerance, the less scrutiny it's becoming. And also, you know, with all the standards that we've got around, um, you know, I, I read three, four, in three languages. Um, and sometimes I get a man user manual for a machine that I bought for the house or small device or whatever the heck, I, you know, power tools, etc. And I'm reading the, the user manual in English. So I understand in English, you know, the other two languages, there's a lot of mistranslation in there. If I apply my, you know, what I need to assemble to one of these languages, I will never be able to assemble that device. So the translation, it's not correct. But people, I don't know if they complain about it or not. I have no idea. But I feel like the tolerance of quality, instead of inching it up, the, from a consumer perspective, I think the tolerance is a little down a little bit. Yes, um, we, we can't get into a situation where we're letting machines make our decisions for us. The uh, output is very useful, but it's only useful if we then apply our brains to that uh, output. Mm -hmm. I just read a, uh, uh, my partner just bought a pair of clippers to clip our cat's claws. And uh, on the front, there's a picture showing you that you mustn't clip too far up uh, because otherwise you'll hit the part of the claw that's still alive. Well, that part in English is called the quick. And that came out in French because everything in Canada is labeled in both languages. That came out in French as rapide, rapid. Oh, okay. Which, of course, has nothing to, nothing yeah, to do yeah. with, uh, <laughs> with it. Now, on the back, it had instructions where everything where it was all correct, where they talked about dealing with the living part, making sure that you don't touch the living part of the claw. But I think the front part that I just mentioned, uh, I think that had come from a machine. I suspect very strongly that had come from a machine and no one had no had bothered to notice that. Correct. Correct. So you're right. You still have to apply. But, you know, the everybody I talked to, Everybody agrees that machines are learning fast, especially with the neural uh, neural MT that we talk about. So the um, the science behind neural learning patterns, et cetera, is increasing and it's becoming more effective in terms of um, in terms of that increasing the accuracy and uh, increasing the better output we're getting. Like the statistical machine translation that we started with in the um, in the early two thousand is much different than what it is right now. I think it was 2012, if I memory correct me, memory uh, treats me well on this one, um, when we started with statistical machine translation, and now we moved to a neural MT, et cetera. So a human is learning as, as adapting and adapting technology as we are moving along here. But I agree with you. I wrote a blog uh, a couple of years ago, three years ago, about the need for uh, coexistence between human and machines for a long time. And so um, you need to have boundaries and you need to ensure certainty uh, of, of content when uh, the output is coming from a machine. I do agree that we need uh, both because of what the pressure is coming to in terms of how many contents we have to deal with. But I do agree with you, uh, human needs to be in the middle. Yes, well, the a big challenge, I think, for the people who are trying to improve machine translation is seeing beyond the sentence. There's still huge problems with pronoun references. 
I, I just looked at a, um, a translation from a Romance language, I'm not sure which one it was, uh, into English. And there was a reference in it uh, to a table, which in that Romance language was a feminine noun. And so the table was referred to in several sentences after it was first introduced. And the first time it was correctly translated by the, the English pronoun it. Mm -hmm. or to a table is it. But in the next sentence, it was she. Oh, I see. <laughs> and believe it or not, three sentences later, it was he. Oh, wow. <laughs> so, so wait, you're uh, right. The context it, is, it is very important. Sentence. Correct. So the context in which way you're using these words, it cannot, you know, it, the problem is the human brain is an emotional and, and logical brain, and then machines are all mathematics and, and formulas and algorithms. Hmm. And, you know, we look for pattern in, in a sort of, I'm a, you know, my background is technology. So I'm, from what I, you know, used to do when I was a programmer is you look for, you know, you write logic, you write, uh, you know, specific steps, you look for things that they're clearly identifiable. And, you know, your human brain, that's why, you know, when, when I asked you, so what do you think about the industry in the next few months, a year, um, you know, the human brain jump into like, I'm going to figure it out. I'm, you know, but the machines probably, if I tell, you know, uh, if I ask chat GPT, what do you think is going to happen in the next six months to a year? I'll get a very probably scientific answer. Maybe I should try that. Get a scientific answer based on some news that we've been analyzed over time. And, and here's the conclusion. <laughs> well, that's a good idea. Yes. <laughs> Excellent. So, um, we're coming on uh, on our, and, and it's really intriguing to be talking uh, revision and translation fundamentals with you, uh, Brian. I really appreciate your time with me this morning. Uh, any last uh, comments uh, for the audience or for the channel uh, before we turn any comments to me? Well, I guess you can say that the proof when it comes to using technologies, <clears throat> uh, the proof of the pudding will be in the eating. We'll see what happens. There's too much hype, too much talk about how wonderful everything is going to be. Uh, so I guess that's what I would say. Uh, we don't want to reject machines, but on the other hand, we want to be very careful and not believe all the hype. Mm -hmm. Absolutely. So again, um, words of wisdom. Thank you, Brian, for being with me this morning. I really appreciate your time. Thanks to the audience for uh, watching this video and uh, sharing this video and liking it. Hopefully it uh, engaged a little bit of uh, uh, some intriguing thoughts and some intriguing ideas for you. If you need more information uh, about this conversation, please reach out to me and I'll put you in touch with Brian. Uh, thank you so much, everybody, for being on the channel this morning. And thanks, Brian, for being with me. And you are welcome to come back to this channel anytime you want. Thank you.